Thank you. Thank you for coming out. So I've really been looking forward to this. This is, as you know, an experiment. This is a live streaming version of my Ask Me Anything episode of the podcast. And uh, I just want to say a few things to, to manage expectations here. I really want this to be a conversation. And so it's, you know, I, unlike a Q&A after a normal event, we can really let this breathe. We can, we can have follow-up questions. Um, with a group this size, probably at least one of you is completely crazy. <laughs> um, I would bet that five of you are so woke that I'll have better luck with the crazy person. So uh, we'll just see what we get here. It's, but I really, um, I think this is a, uh, a new format for me, and, and uh, I'm, I'm just very honored that you all came out. So uh, let's let's uh, let's go. So ask me anything. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. Uh, so you've said in the past that you have little respect for the traditional uh, boundaries between historically siloed academic fields. Um, you've modeled this as, as, an, as an example in your own career, so studying both philosophy and neuroscience, mm. um, and you've leveraged that to be a relatively a highly successful contributor to, <clears throat> to uh, areas where people think about belief and, and thought and action. Um, there seems to be a movement happening uh, where a lot of other people who are doing, say, their bachelor's or their master's degree in one area and then wanting to do uh, graduate work later in their life in traditionally a very different area, but for a common goal, sort of like you did. Uh, and that's be that mentality is becoming more popular. I'm wondering what uh, advice you'd have and what stories you'd like to share from your experience of having lived in both circles, and would you consider uh, interviewing someone on your podcast about this topic? Yeah, so I have, I have advice that is, you know, I, I don't know if it's applicable to, to everyone. And obviously the landscape of careers is changing so quickly. I mean, like, so what I'm doing now didn't have a name. I mean, a podcast literally was not uh, a noun I knew until like maybe 10 years ago, right? So at no point in my life was I preparing to do what I'm now spending a lot of time doing, and likewise with apps. I mean, so as far as practical advice, I, I don't have a ton except uh, I think it's I think not respecting the boundaries between disciplines is uh, a good algorithm because it's, I mean I think you sh you should specialize because you have to know something, but. Once you specialize up to a certain point, you should be looking for ways to to fertilize or, or cross pollinate other areas because it's, I mean these these are arbitrary silos that people get into. So, but um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll move on from that. But that's 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 something that um, there's no I don't have a recipe for it. But I I just think we should be cognizant of the fact that some of the best ideas come over the transom you know, from, from physics into biology and, and uh, from philosophy into neuroscience. I mean, it's just there's, there's, a, there's a lot where, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, peop the people who are rigid uh, with respect to the boundaries in those disciplines, I think there's, there's a reason why uh, they, they don't say much of interest that's, that's publicly usable most of the time. I mean, I think we... we what we desperately need are uh, people who can figure out how to converge with, with the, the, the best ideas on common problems as, as quickly as possible. So, so anyone else? Anyone? Hi. Um, people prone to conspiracy theory thinking mm. tend to uh, not seem to uh, be swayed by the quality of the evidence. Um, you know, they, they often will believe in multiple conspiracy theories or they'll believe um, in even two that are logically inconsistent with each other. Right. 
So this would almost suggest a sort of a kind of mental illness. So I wonder if with your neuroscience background and also with your uh, occasional butting up against conspiracy thinking now, um, if you have an opinion as to whether we will one day diagnose conspiracy thinking on a continuum <laughs> as a kind of spectrum disorder with something like schizophrenia and possibly <laughs> even uh, uh, discover biomarkers in the same way that fMRI is discovering irregularities in, yeah, well, in schizophrenia. There, there is a, uh, this is not psychological literature that I'm close to, but I know that there's a, a typology in the sense that people tend to believe many conspiracy theories, right? So the, the, the person who doesn't think we landed on the moon is not totally rational on all the other questions about, you know, JFK or, or anything else that's, that's on the menu of conspiracy theories. So uh, there's something about, there, there's clearly a deeper layer of doubt with respect to just common knowledge, or what purports to be common knowledge. And um, it, uh, they have a, I'm getting, uh, is, uh, this, is, this is loud, sorry, this is, um, um, I mean, I'm, am I hearing voices or are we all hearing voices? <laughs> uh, just checking. Uh, so, um, I mean, yeah, so you, I mean, you pointed to some of the structure of it. So, so people will not notice that they're using multiple incompatible theories to explain anomalies, and they, they, they feel no burden to integrate them into a whole. So I, mean, they, I, I get this a lot with 9-11 truth, right? So they, you can find anomaly after anomaly, and yet if, if you look at the extrapolations that are based on the fact that, you know, you know how is it that you know, we were doing an exercise with our F-15s or whatever, and it was an Air Force ex exercise, and they were sent out over the Atlantic. Forgive me if anyone, if I'm getting this wrong, but it's something like this. Um, and, you know, uh, that seems strange, right? So, okay, so, the Air, so, now, so now you're saying the Air Force High Command was involved. I mean, this, this is part of the theory, but then that breaks down when you look at some other part of the theory. So there, there's never, there's a, there's a burden of consistency that these people don't tend to feel, and then also not recognizing that there are improbable coincidences in any set of facts that, you know, I mean, just the fact that you're all sitting I exactly where you are in this theater, right? There's, there, you know, what are the chances of that, right? It's, it's a, um, anything you look at after the fact looks like a kind of miracle in terms of the, 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 how unlikely it would be to occur in precisely that way. The fact that this water bottle is exactly where it is on the table, you know, it's, uh, I, if I try as hard as I could, I wouldn't be able to get it exactly there again intentionally, right? So after the fact, you can always tell a story of how improbable something is, and yet things have to happen some way, so. Um, got one in the front row here. Thanks. Hi, Sam. Uh, let's step aside maybe a little bit. This is just as close sure. as I've ever needed uh, to be, have a microphone to talk to somebody. So. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah. So, obviously it's possible to not wrap your head around the topic of free will and still get great benefit out of meditation. But once I was really uh, digested your arguments and, and accepted that free will it was an illusion, I discovered that with that came the immediate ability to kind of dissolve the self, the ego, with just a single moment of introspection. Mm. So, so maybe you can, you can speak a little bit to, to how you view the importance and the uh, utility of the free will topic to people achieving their goals as, as far as meditation goes. Well, it does drop out of the experience of, of cutting through the feeling of self. I mean, it's really the, the obverse of that coin, right? I mean, it, it's, it's not one that anyone tends to emphasize, and it's... Um, it I mean, both of them sound spooky to people. The idea that you you may not have a self, or that the self you think you have is illusory, and that you may not have the free will you think you have, I and mean, both of those sound like bad news to most people. Um, so I, you know, I'm one of those people who is hawking meditation, and the way I'm hawking it sounds terrifying to most people in terms of what what, um, what the punchline is. It's um, but both insights are incredibly liberating. I mean, you don't, you don't lose something you think you, that you, you wanted in the end when you see that free will 
doesn't make any sense conceptually. And when you experience, I mean, there, there are there are different ways you could you could feel your will undermined, and some of those are pathological, right? I mean, you can have alien hand syndrome, right, where you know, based on you know, getting a stroke in the right part of the brain, you would feel that your, you know, your left hand very likely is just not yours, right? So when it when when it's doing something, you would feel. Uh, I mean, there are people who want, you know, who 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 wake up in in bed and feel that someone's in bed with them and try to try to shove their, you know, half of their body out of bed, right, so that they they uh, can get free of it. So um, that's not the kind of disturbance of uh, the normal sense of will that you know one is going after in meditation or, or by any other method. Uh, but it's just, it's a greater sensitivity. To, the more you pay attention to how things arise subjectively, just the next thought, I mean, what's, what's the next thought going to be? You don't know until it appears, right? And, and your sense of who you are, the, the more you pay attention to the way consciousness is, your sense of who you are keeps dropping back into just being the, the theater of all these appearances, and thoughts are included, and moods are included, and even the sense of, of intention is included. So, uh, I mean, people feel like the, 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 the sense of, of self and the sense of, of uh, having a will that is free is synonymous with the feeling that you are authoring your thoughts and intentions, right? So like, it's like, I'm doing it, you know, I'm deciding to reach, and yet paying closer attention to the process always reveals that, no, no, there was something upstream of that feeling of intention, and it just, it just, it, it, it emerged out of, out of nowhere, really. And um, again, that, that sense, it may sound scary to, 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 Feel that you know palpably moment to moment, but it's not. It's a feeling of just of just. Um, it really is. It's it's like the flow state that people tend to have in peak moments of athleticism, or or where there where there's no distance between them and their experience. Right? They just they they have these moments of. They're not looking over their own shoulder, trying to improve anything. They're not worried about how something's going to going to wind up. They're totally one with the experience, whether it's athletic or artistic or or cognitive, and you, and so and the truth is, everyone, whether they be, whether you meditate or not, you're losing yourself in these experiences of immersion in in something you're doing. The difference between meditation and those moments of flow or those moments of full immersion is that it's. It's the loss of self is clear. The loss of self is what is m most salient, right? It is it is the thing you're paying attention to in the end, rather than surfing or or sex or whatever whatever the thing is that is causing you to sort of forget yourself for a moment. So um, uh, let's 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 stay in this area and exhaust either your boredom or terror for for a moment, and then then we'll move on. So does anyone have a question that's sort of on uh, on this? Yeah, we got several hands in the back. Hey, Sam. Hey. Um, so this is on the topic of consciousness as well. So I'm familiar with, um, I think most of us are, Nagel's definition of consciousness, that there is something that it is like to be something, then we can claim that thing is conscious. Uh, that's always struck me as too broad, because I think there's a lot of things you could imagine there might be something that it is like to be, like, um, say, an ant or a computer virus or something like that. Um, so I'd like to just run a slightly more narrow definition past you and see what you think of okay. it. And that's um, that consciousness could be the existence of a uh, sub-process in the mind whose purpose is to analyze your behavior and update your mental models of the world um, based on new information. So more than just instinct, um, but it's kind of like a recursive um, process whose sole purpose is to uh, analyze your mental models. Yeah, I mean, there are just many experiences that don't really answer to that description. I mean, I guess they might. I mean, so there's there's an experience that you could have that's just really shorn of any 
data, right? You can have a, a kind of a pure consciousness experience where there's no seeing, no hearing, no smelling, no tasting, no touching, no thinking, and there's just kind of the pure openness of of knowing and. Now, that could just be what it's like when all these information channels go silent, right? It's just like having your television on, but it's you know there's nothing, nothing broadcast. Uh, but uh, I mean, the first thing you said that there, there could be you don't like the phraseology of something. There's something that it's like. This could be something that it's like to be a, a computer program or an ant. That's the, the the something that it's like phrase from this comes from Thomas Nagel, his his uh, very influential essay, "What Is It Like to Be a Bat?" It's not spoken from the outside. It's not, what is it like to be a bat? It's, what is it like to be a bat from the inside, for the bat, right? And, that, and he's saying that's synonymous with, that's what we mean by consciousness. He's not saying that that explains anything. It's just that's, if, if there's something that it's like to be a bat from the inside, right, whether we could ever know it or not, that's what we mean when we're talking about consciousness. And it is a kind of, you know, you could, it's certainly been faulted for being a circular definition, but th that's the problem with consciousness. I think it's, many people think it's, it's a, uh, an unreducible concept. Whether or, not, whether or not it's identical to something in the physical world that is, to which it's reducible, like information processing at, at a certain hertz or whatever, right? And so that may in fact be true, but the concept, what we mean by consciousness, really refers to this notion of the lights being on or not uh, from the inside. One in the middle here. Uh, okay, my question is, why do we have so many thoughts? And uh, we've been practicing your your app. We're like fifty in. It's oh nice. It's amazing. Nice. Um, but one thing that's happened is when you really narrow down into you know thinking of nothing, you end up f a thought just pops in there, and it's yeah, from yeah. who knows where, and. Yeah. Yeah, back in time, thinking into the future, it's the weirdest thing. So yeah. uh, you do so, sound like you've been using the app. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. So so yeah, really, what's going on in my head when, I mean, from a neuroscientist, I mean, you should, I, I think you study this stuff, or you should understand it a little bit better than I do. What's happening in my brain, and why are there so many thoughts in there, and constant? Yeah, yeah. Why is it being flooded? There's well, much. so w we know a little bit about this, but not all that much, but there, there's a, a, a system in the brain called the default mode network, which, are, which is a series of, of midline structures, I mean, directly down the middle of the brain, uh, front to back, which are more active when people are just ruminating, when, when, when you're just thinking. And it's, it's called the default mode because in every neuroimaging experiment ever devised, people know, the experimenters notice that when people are on task, you're, you know, you're showing somebody you know, cards they have to read or whatever, these areas, uh, g these midline structures reduce their activity, and then between tasks, activity goes up again. And, and so it's called the default mode uh, because it seems to be the brain's default state when it's not, when attention isn't outwardly directed on a, on a task. And this actually links up with what I was saying before about losing yourself in a, in a task or losing yourself in your work or in play. Um, what happens is, so the default mode is, is also correlated with uh, self-reference when you give people a task where they have to think about themselves or think about whether a word applies to them, to, to you or not, that region or those regions increase their activity. So. Uh, it, it seems to be this this area that governs just kind of wandering mind, rumination, self-reference, thinking about yourself, uh, and activity is driven down there by several things. One, just putting your attention suddenly on something out in the world. Um, it's driven it's it's driven down more by mindfulness, and it's driven down more still by psychedelics like psilocybin uh, and the um, I mean f again this work is, is still fairly preliminary in my view but it, it does offer a clue to the fact that there's there's a common experience between losing the sense of self in each of these modes right in outward attention where you're where you're 
Um, I mean, I would argue this, uh, this, this is not many people saying this, but this seems quite true to me, that people are losing their sense of self all the time and only finding it retrospectively. It's like when I tap you on the shoulder and say, are you still there? All of a sudden you feel like yourself again. But you, you weren't, and you're not in a position to notice the interruption in that feeling when, you're bur- when your attention is buried in something like you're watching television or you're, you're you know, reading a, a sentence. Uh, whereas with meditation, with psychedelics, there is this m- much more vivid, or, or that's, there can be a much more vivid loss of, of self. But as far as why thoughts are constantly arising, I, it just seems that uh, language is so useful for us, and we're so, uh, at this point, evolved to use it and to think conceptually and to represent the world in our thoughts incessantly, that once this automaticity turns on you know, in the first years of life, once, once people talk to us enough such that we begin to uh, you know, play this language game with them and then we internalize it, and, and, and you, you can see this with kids, where kids are talking to themselves in the same way that like, they're, they're talking to their parents. Like you, you, you talk to your parents, you talk to your parents, you talk to your parents, and then at a certain point your parents leave the room and you're, you're left still talking. To them, to, to your, and now to yourself, but it, that does have a, an odd structure cognitively. I mean, it's, it is just it is peculiar that we feel this need, and that it seems normal to consistently verbalize to ourselves. You know, in, in the silence, uh, in the other, in uh, otherwise, what would be the silence of our minds? And it, it's clearly pathological when you actually do it out loud, right? When, you're, when you suddenly, and we, and we treat people who are talking to themselves out loud as a different class of person, uh, although uh, you know, we, we occasionally do it you know, briefly ourselves, but it's, if, you can't, if you can't stop the verbalization, that's when you're crazy. But if you just know enough to keep your mouth shut, that uh, apparently is sanity. Uh, but there's not much of a difference. And if everyone could hear what you were thinking to yourself, you know, you would you would clearly be certifiable, right? So you, you got to you got to follow. Up? Yeah. Do you think it's evolutionarily evolutionary, and um, do you think more thoughts are being flooded into our brain, or I mean, just because of the amount of stimulation that we're getting from our phones and the internet and television? And do you think it's useful, or do you think it's yeah, getting yeah. worse? No, I, I, mean, I don't think it's getting worse. I think we're, it, it, couldn't, it could hardly be worse. I mean, we've been thinking, thinking, thinking every minute of our lives the moment we got this ability to, to speak. So it, it's clearly evolved. I mean, we've been doing this for we don't know how many tens of thousands of years. But at a certain point, we were able to you know, just represent our experience linguistically. And... Yeah, I don't think it's being exacerbated. But I mean, there are other problems being exacerbated by our technology. But I, I think we're we're thinking as much as we possibly can, and yeah, trying to meditate proves that to you. Yeah, it's, uh, that's what makes it hard work. So, all right. I think. Oh, well, we have we need a mic for you. Yeah, I can hear you, but the internet can't. Hi, Sam. I'm Susan. Hi, Susan. And first, I just want to say that I'm grateful to be a part of this town hall. Oh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. My question arises from reading the book Free Will. Um, You wrote that a while back. However, I still read it. Through through no free will of your own, (laughs) apparently. (laughs) (laughs) And I reread some passages over and over. I try and get um, beyond what I'm comprehending comprehending to go a little deeper because I always get stuck in one place and it's always the same place. Thus, I read the book and I comprehend, I understand, and I'm captivated and I'm challenged and all goes well until almost at the end of the book. And that's when you say, however, I made the decision to write this book or it would not have been written. And I believe I'm almost saying that verbatim. And when that sentence appears, that's where I lose the connection. And, right. and I apologize. I'm, I'm almost embarrassed because I want, I want to be able to connect that myself. However, I'm not connecting that. I'm OK with no free will. I'm OK with that. I get it. And then you say that sentence, 
this book would not have been written unless I decided to write it. Right. So if you right. could please make that connection for me, sure. I would be grateful. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, well, first, you don't have to keep reading the opening chapter with those, <laughs> those murderers. It's uh, the, the Pettit murders. I, I, don't, I don't like to picture you reading that again and again. Um, that was an awful episode. So, yeah, I mean, this is a point of confusion for many, many people. It's, in part, it's just uh, the semantics of, of how we talk about initiating behavior. The, the proximate cause of many of the things we do consciously is a choice, a decision, a, a willingness to try, right? So there's something, um, the conventional notion of a choice or a decision is fine to use. I mean, I, it's, you know, it's inevitable to talk this way about human behavior, but when you look at the, the actual experience of choosing, it is not, it doesn't answer to any notion of, of what's called libertarian free will, the sense that you could have done otherwise, right? I mean, you're not, even the, the least coerced decision, right? I mean, this is an experiment I, I've done before um, in front of live audiences, maybe you've heard it, but I mean, just think of a restaurant you like to go to. Right now, so there's a moment before I said that, you didn't know what I was gonna say, I said restaurant, and you, your restaurant part of the brain started working. Uh, have you all decided on a restaurant? <laughs> okay, so do this one more time. Okay, you picked the wrong restaurant. So now you have another restaurant, and that experience, if you're human, I would argue, the experience was one of having various restaurants, either visually or linguistically, or some combination of the, uh, of the two, kind of percolate at the margins of consciousness. And you didn't think of every restaurant you've ever been to. You didn't think of every restaurant you could possibly name. If I asked you to list, you know, under pain of death, list every restaurant you could possibly think of, well then you would, you would find more to think about than had just spontaneously arisen. So there was this kind of competition for a winner and then you chose one and you might have vacillated between two, right? Oh, I don't really like that one, that's, that's embarrassing. What if he asked me which restaurant it was? I don't want to say that. You know, and then you, you go back and forth, but then you land on one. That whole process is mysterious, right? There's nothing about that that you are really authoring, right? It's just, it's, it's more of the universe happening. And it's, and to say that you could have done otherwise, I mean, you, you could do, to say that you could have done otherwise is a conventional thing to say about human experience. Like right now, you could do, you could pick another restaurant right now. I mean, to say you could have done otherwise then is really just a way of saying, in the future, in similar situations, you'll be able to do something else, right? You're, if, if I said to you, actually, I really don't want you to pick that restaurant again because you know, I, I find it offensive, well then, you could, you could take that into account and you could do otherwise. And so that, that's, that's sort of the normal regime of human decision making. But to say that you could have done otherwise a few moments ago is really to speak nonsense in the sense that, you know, there are certain restaurants you know that just didn't occur to you. you know, and, and to say that, I mean, your brain was not in a state such that, you know, what, whatever, Applebee's was going to occur to you, right? Um, I don't know why I went to Applebee's. <laughs> Probably half of you thought of Applebee's. That's the, that's, that's the, the poison of marketing, I guess. Uh, so it's not, the, the, if you knew, if we could put you in an experiment where you know, men and, or, and women in white lab coats could predict seven seconds in advance of you, I mean, you, you, what would you, at a period where you know you feel like you're still making up your mind, and we could show you, you know, we could go to the videotape and we could show you that they were writing, already transcribing the name of the restaurant that you were going to pick, uh, and we know we can do experiments more, that are more or less like that now. Uh, 
which is to say, again, you're at a moment where you think you are still making up your mind, where, you, where if I could say, have you, made, have you decided yet? You say, no, no, I'm still back and forth, back and forth, right? We, we can predict with 95% you know, likelihood which, which restaurant you're gonna pick. Uh, that completely deflates this notion of you could have, that you could have done otherwise, right? So it's not, but the, but the basic principle is that, yes, before doing anything, certainly anything that's a, a real project, right, like you know, learning to play a musical instrument, right, it's not gonna happen by accident, right? That this, this free will argument doesn't suggest that, well, you should just wait around and see what happens. Uh, it, everything's still, it, there's just a lawful way to learn things, to get things done in the world. Effort still matters, but in e each moment of making an effort, it is, ins it is inscrutable just why that amount of effort shows up and not a little bit more or a little bit less, right? Why does, you know, someone tries to inspire you, you know, someone says something to you and it has an effect on you, well, it has precisely that effect for reasons you can't totally own, right? I mean, you didn't, you know, and, and, it, and the fact that it didn't have 10% more or 10% less is, is mysterious. So recognizing the kind of the mysteriousness of your own subjective life and the fact that you actually don't have control in each moment over what you think or what you intend uh, isn't incompatible with actually being moved intelligently toward things you want to do, right? You, you, you want them. You didn't pick all your desires, you, but you find yourself wanting certain things and you are free to pursue those things you want, right? There's, there's still a difference. Without, with or without free will, there's still a difference between being free to do what you want and not being free to do what you want. I mean, that difference still matters. Nothing, nothing changes there. So I don't know if I completely confused you or not, but, but, but again, so but like even in this moment, like so, it, like if that didn't make any sense, right? That's not an experience of free will, right? It's like it just it didn't make any sense. If it made perfect sense, and you, you said, aha, now I get it, right? That just happens, right? That that's, doesn't feel like free will either, really. It just, so that in either case, there's, there's just what's happening in each moment. And recognizing that can give you other degrees of freedom. Again, not free will, but like it can give you... When I, so I mean, another thing that might be confusing is that when I talk about one of the effects of meditation being that you can let go of negative emotion, Right, like you suddenly get angry, and then you can decide, how, do I really want to be angry about this? And then you can just drop it. Right now, if you can't be mindful, you've got no freedom at all in that space. You're just going to be as angry for as long as you're going to be angry. But if you can be mindful, you can just drop it. But that's not free will. That's just a, a new capacity. That's like being able to, you know, ride a unicycle. Right? And there are people who can ride a unicycle. There are people who can't. It's a kind of skill, but it, in neither case does it demand that that free will exists. So, um, all right. So I'm uh, now I'm open to questions unrelated to something this esoteric, but wherever you want to go. I should say, one of my interests in in doing this, in setting this up like this, is that I really want you to tell me if you think I'm doing something stupid, saying something stupid, if I could be better at anything. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 want, I want some feedback, whether it's something I said stupid yesterday or a month ago, uh, or in this context. I, there, there's some... Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm thirsty for sort of course correction coming from you all. So, so if, if I'm not making sense, please don't be shy. Yeah. Um. First, just a thank you for, um, I was one of the, and I'm sure people in this group too, uh, got, that got pang burned, it's one oh, of your terms. Yeah, well, and uh, you, you did a really nice uh, goodwill gesture of, of giving tickets to the um, Danny Kahneman. So, oh, great. Um, I'm glad you made friend it. friend and I here, uh, not, not only did we get the tickets as a gesture of goodwill from you, but they're actually terrific seats. Ah, so well, that's right as dead, it should be. Right dead yeah, center. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I've been struggling with a, a few different questions, some sort of selfish for me, my own experiences with meditation, sort of alluding to that spookiness that you're talking about, um, as well as sort of how you um, invoke meditation 
um, during events when things go sideways for yourself. So maybe I can do a two part mm -hmm. question. That's works. Sure. Sure. So on the spookiness factor, which um, gentleman up there in the corner talked about and you alluded to, um, <clears throat> I've been meditating for quite a bit and I started uh, be becoming a beta tester for your app back in December 2017. So I've been in it for quite a while. Went through the waking up, went through the free will books, and then when I hit, when I went to on having no head, that sort of. That, that's when it got scary, or. Yeah, that's yeah. when I, that's when it got a little spooky. So yeah. I, w I was kind of happy to hear that there, that's a normal thing to go through. But my experience was, and it wasn't overnight, but I just came to this point where I almost became hyper aware. So uh, I guess the, the analogy is I sort of went to standard, from standard definition, I kind of skipped HD and went to 4K. Right. <laughs> so I was right. sort of walking around downtown a little bit with that on having no head feeling and going, you know, have I gone too far? So I actually sort of withdrew from, from using the meditation app right. and, and kind right. of backed off because I felt like I went a little forward. Um, so anyhow... That's the first question. Is that is that a normal sort of experience? And how do you sort of gauge when you want to sort of push it and when you kind of have to to pull back? Well, I, I would say that if anything is happening that worries you or that seems you know, incompatible with with well being, pulling back is a good idea, right? It's, it's just not. It's it is true that as you get deeper into meditation it doesn't just get more and more pleasant, right? I mean, there, there are patches that are fairly well described where you can, you can experience un unpleasant things more vividly. And I mean, even just in the course this way, you can just notice more about yourself as unflattering, right? Like you just notice that you're, you can notice what your intentions actually are in a conversation rather than what you w want, want them to seem to be, right? And um, so there's a kind of self-awareness that I think is progress, but it can make you less and less comfortable in, in certain contexts. Um, but as far as what you're describing, yeah, I mean, there, so again, obviously I don't know anything about you in particular, and there, there, there are ways to undermine a sense of self that are clearly destabilizing for some people and, and not not the target of meditation. And so if, and this doesn't really happen very much in daily practice. I mean, if you're sitting 10 minutes a day or an hour a day or whatever it is. In silent retreat, there are certainly some people who just shouldn't be meditating for 12 hours a day, right? Because they get, it becomes a kind of crucible where they get pushed into very intense states and they can be scary and, you know, people can depersonalize in ways that are not not you know compatible with with uh, mental health and so there's it's a um, again it's a t it's a, it's a very small percentage of people but there are people who do feel that certain I mean, this free will consideration destabilizes some people I mean, some people feel like thinking about this is bad for me right and and you know I hear occasionally from these people uh, and I so I usually when I talk about free will I I often offer a disclaimer where it's just like, listen, if this whole conversation feels bad for you, you know, go to the bar and, and I'll meet you there afterwards. Uh, and so, yeah, I would just say that, that it's... Um, I mean, the, the sweet spot for this experience of just losing a sense of self or, or, or recognizing that you have no head, to use Douglas Harding's uh, metaphor, is just more. It's just more openness, and the 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 loss of uh, for, for a, a very clear scene of experience where uh, negative emotion doesn't really have a place to land or to, to start from, right? Because you're not getting for that moment. You're not getting captured by the normal thought that would make you neurotic, right? But what can happen for people is that they begin to be have they begin to have uh, unusual experiences in meditation, which they're thinking about incessantly, right? And the thoughts are conveying the anxiety or the or the grandiosity, or you know, I've you know, I've met people who you know thought they were fully enlightened, and 
they were thinking about how enlightened they were, you know, every minute of the day, and and not noticing the, the thought as thought. So, you know, if you're suffering, mean, the, the generic answer I would give you is that if you're suffering, you are thinking, mm. right? And then that's and to to drop back and see this the anxious thought as a thought is is a remedy in that moment, uh, and um, you know I would encourage it, but. Again, you know, just going and watching Game of Thrones could be a better use of your attention if you feel uh, at all anxious with what with what's going on in, in any session. So, yeah, uh, fair, fair enough. Sure. Uh, just the second part, and I'll sure. hand it off. Is um, could you just give us an example, maybe a recent example where things may have gone um, sideways for you, and how you invoked the practices and the principles that you've been teaching us through waking up, how you applied them. Where they, um, where sure, it, where it worked sure. and where it fell short and uh, and why. Um, well, well, so to, today is a good example. So I, I've been kind of fighting a migraine all day, and so when it was coming on around, I don't know, two o'clock today, I thought, oh fuck, I have got a live event and I've got a you know a freight train bearing down on my head right now. Uh, so that's a thought, right? Oh fuck. Right. And, and not noticing it as a thought, that just feels like me, right? Like, I, I, gotta, I gotta get up on stage, the bright lights, I'm gonna be the squinty guy who's photophobic, right? I'm thinking about these things. And to notice the thoughts as thoughts is very different than not noticing them. And it doesn't mean that I can't take intelligent steps to mitigate my migraine. So you know, I, I popped a bunch of Advil, I did whatever I could do, but the recognition that I have no control over the result of all that, right? I can, all I can do is intelligently do the things that one does to get rid of a migraine, and then the rest is up to just whatever's going to happen, right? And the getting, stepping out of the thoughts immediately cancels the the basis of the of the anxiety or the or you know or the concern right so like you don't have to be identified with the, you don't have to ruminate or perseverate in the way that we normally do in order to just check all the boxes of intelligent things you should do right so advil check right and then the question is just how much do you want to suffer in this moment uh, and it works the same with the, with the physical pain itself. It's like the, the sense that that I can't, you know, this is this is too unpleasant for me to be to truly be at peace with um, is almost always an illusion because you're so much of our resistance to physical pain is just the worry about what it's going to be like later in the next moment, or in this case, you know, what was it going to be like later tonight, which is which is in, in fact now, and. Um, but the truth is, in the present moment, you've actually ju you've already borne the pain you think you can't bear. I mean, my migraine wasn't that bad, but the 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 pain that you that you it's it's very easy to get into a mode where you think my well-being, my happiness is predicated on getting rid of this experience. Right? I can't be happy now in the midst of that exp of this experience, and that's um, that's actually an illusion. I mean, and mindfulness is the is the thing that that reveals that to be an illusion. But it's um, you know, it's 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 a skill that, that that needs to be trained, and it's hard to get the skill in hand when you really need it, right? It's it's hard. It's 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 useful to train when things are good, rather than uh, when when life is is as chaotic as it will one day be for every one of us. I mean, every one of us is going to have the worst day of our lives at some point, and uh, the question is what. You know, what skill set do you want in, in the midst of that? And, and there are definitely things we can all learn to to experience that more uh, with, with the least amount of unnecessary suffering. And, and certainly, meditation is is um, one of those things. So, okay, I'll let uh, let the people with the mic choose the next hand. Hi, Sam. Thanks for coming. Hey, out. thanks for coming. Uh, so this is a completely different direction. Um, sure. So I was listening to a podcast the other day, or I guess a TED Talk about nuclear war. It scared the hell out of me. So mm -hmm. um, besides AI, which I love what you talk about with AI, uh, what existential risks do you consider most important and think about the most and why? Thank you. Um, 
Well, the threat of nuclear war, either intentional or accidental, that's, I think that's the highest. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, that's the... <coughs> I'm, I'm especially concerned about that because so many people seem to no longer be concerned about it. I mean, it's, it just seems like we, we feel like that we won the Cold War. It's, you know, we don't have to think about duck and cover drills anymore. And what we really have are all of these ICBMs still pointed at us with aging technology governing them and with uh, fewer... Of, of the real professionals whose job it was to, to think about all this, uh, manning their battle stations. You know, I, I you just get the sense that, I mean, who, like, people like William Perry, I mean, William Perry is, what, 85 years old, 90 years old? I mean, th these, are, these were the people who grew up knowing this was the greatest risk to all of us. And, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not in the government. I don't, I don't know how professional the people are who, whose job it is to, to mitigate this risk. But, it's, um, I just feel like collectively we've all gone to sleep uh, uh, with respect to nukes. And it is, um, it's amazing to consider that we, we all have this sort of Damocles over our heads. And when you read the history of just how we have escaped nuking ourselves up till now, we have relied on luck to an immense degree, I mean, to, to an absolutely disconcerting degree. I mean, we have, we have dropped nuclear bombs on ourselves, and they just didn't go off, right? Uh, there was a, f a famous drop in, I think it was North Carolina, where, you know, two of three safeties failed. And uh, I believe the final safety that, that kept a, a, an H-bomb from not detonating uh, on, on um, U.S. soil was literally a, a, like a, a physical toggle switch. I mean, it was not, I mean, this is, it's just mind boggling. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's absolutely number one. And, uh, but yeah, synthetic biology, um, biological terrorism, uh, you know, anything that, that, um, I mean, this, the scary thing about, uh, Synthetic biology and and bioweaponry is just that it's it's the kind of thing where the ability. I don't know if you heard my podcast with Nick Bostrom, but there there the thing about that's scary about nukes is that they're already in place and we 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 they're they're linked to systems where they could be tripped at any time and we're we're not we don't have a sense that they're being handled necessarily well. The thing about synthetic biology is where it's, it's very different. We're democratizing this technology, or we're poised to democratize it in a way where people, you know, there'll be high school projects where, where people are going to engineer new bacteria or, you know, edit viruses or at least have the capacity to do that if we, if we do what many people are speculating will be a great idea. I mean, there are people who, who imagine that we're all going to have DNA printers uh, in our homes, ultimately, and we'll, we'll just, I mean, you know, manufacture our own pharmaceuticals. You know, you'll, you'll just download the recipe, and and you get your fresh um, vaccine. You know, in your home right now, that had the the ability to do that has all kinds of consequences that we really need to think through, and the time to figure out that that's a recipe for for homemade. Bio war, uh, you know, is now. I think not not after someone gave their TED talk uh, on how to weaponize smallpox. Uh, so, anyway, I mean, those those are, uh, you know, as you can tell, I worry about a few things, but I, I'm, I think nukes is is really the one without a second for the moment. Okay, Over here. Hi, Sam. Hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, so this is actually a great follow-up question to that um, because just for a little context, I'm actually a graduate student at UC San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, I study chemical biology. In particular, my lab studies synthetic biology right. and um, Oh, so you're the cells. one who's going to do this. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, and to some extent, we're also interested in the origins of life. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm kind of curious about your thoughts on is 
obviously there's a lot of interest in this synthetic biology area, AI, looking for life on other planets. So something that I think is interesting to consider is what actually constitutes life like at the most basic level. Um, so what I'd like to know from you is what are your thoughts about what are the minimal requirements for something to actually be considered alive? Well, I, I, I actually don't have a good answer for that. I, mean, I, I don't think anyone does because I mean, life is something that we, we define from the, unlike consciousness, life is something we can define from the outside based on what a system does. And to, drawing a line there is somewhat arbitrary. I mean, so we, we have a list of things that living systems do. They metabolize, they reproduce, um, they, they can heal themselves, right? And, and they can grow up to a certain point. And you can always find some, something that answers to you know, nine of the 10, and then it's, it's kind of arbitrary as to whether or not it's alive, right? Does, you know, is a virus alive? I think that's not entirely clear. Um, uh, or you know, it's something that, um, uh, it's definitional rather than, in principle, a, a kind of bright line in nature that we, we should r respect, I think. So, um, I mean, we'll run into this where we, if we build, you know, machines, you know, artificial, uh, pure artifice, something that's just non-biological, we could build a machine, that, well, whatever list of criteria we have for life, we might build a machine that answers to all of those things and it's a, a completely different substrate and it will, be, it will be weird to say that it's alive because it's not, it's not made of meat in any sense, right? It's just, it's not wet, it's not, you know, it's a machine. Uh, but uh, it's totally conceivable that it would just, you know, what we mean by life is true in, the, in, in that case. And so it's, uh, and it'll, it'll violate the intuition that, that, of, that life is as we are familiar with it, with, with animals and plants. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know, but the, the, the difference for me is with consciousness, um, unlike life, consciousness is, is kind of an irreducible concept. It's like you either you sort of get it or you don't, and it's either on or off, right? So. Yeah. Hey, Sam, thanks hey. for being here. Um, my question is, was there a properly rational worldview is there any room at all for, I don't know, anything that could be rightfully categorized as, I don't know, supernatural, perhaps pertaining to consciousness or to something else, but not properly rational mm. worldview? Thank you. Yeah, well, so, yeah, I don't think the boundary between reason and what people consider supernatural is, is there, right? I mean, so, so, there are many things we can't explain, right? And there's, there are many things we don't understand. There are many things we don't know about. Uh, and there are many things that, w that if we confronted them for the first time, they would seem like magic or they would seem like miracles. Uh, and there's, just, there's no reason to think that, that we, we can't continually be astounded by what's true. But the question is, what will all that look like if we had a, a perfect knowledge of, of how that thing is arising, right? And so the, the, the knowledge, the, the rational part, removes the mystery, you know? And, and so once you remove the mystery of how things, how something happened, uh, then it's, there's no temptation to call it supernatural, right? It's just more, there's just more nature in that case. We've understood more, more of, the story. Now, the flip side of this is that I think there is a mystery to existence that never gets banished, right? And, and it's, it's always here, it's always available to be noticed, uh, even in the most mundane thing. And so, so explanation doesn't cancel all mystery. I mean, I just think, I mean, this is something that I talk about, I think, somewhere in my app. I mean, if you just look at your hand and ask yourself, what is it? you can notice that you actually don't know what it is, right? Like you, ha you have this word, hand, and then you have all these other words about, you know, evolution and bones and nervous systems and, and I mean, you, you, can, you can keep hurling language 
and your, your semantic knowledge against this perception. But if you, if you really pay attention and ask yourself, what is it? It's as mysterious as an object as you could ever find. I mean, it's, it's just, and it's true of everything. It's like bottle cap. Well, this is a bottle cap. You could, if you say bottle cap a hundred times while looking at this thing, it doesn't, there, there's, there's something fundamentally inscrutable about anything. Our concepts don't really reach in to the experience totally. Um, and so that, so that you know, if, if there's a mystery that never gets fully dispatched by knowledge, it's that. But, but again, it's that, it's that with a bottle cap. You don't need you know, the, you know, a quasar or you know, a, um, uh, someone to, to come back from the dead to be confronted by that, and so the, the other mysteries in terms of how things work and where things come from, and um, we're constantly just dispelling them with each new increment of knowledge, you know. Um, I see Eric Weinstein in the audience. Yeah. Um, I, wanna, I wanna hear from Eric Weinstein, the great doctor. Oh, okay. So, Erica, Eric and I were on the phone this morning, and um, this is before my migraine got started. And he, you, Eric, you said something that that I would like to to air publicly. Should I come up? There? Um, sure. Yeah. Because like I was, I was just deep in this moment where I was trying to figure out what, what it was like to be Eric Weinstein. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> got nowhere. Eric, if you don't know him, is one of my most frequent collaborators now and, and uh, the world's most interesting man. Uh, so Eric, Talk about being set up yeah, to yeah, fail. Yeah, that yeah, was no, awesome. Not a, Thanks, Eric. Um, so um, you, uh, you said that one thing you said, you said many things this morning that, that we could pick up on, but you said that um, we have spent so much time responding to bad arguments and, and malice that has made us worse. Now, I, I, I really felt that the onus was on me. I think you were telling me that it has made me worse, and, and I have I've spent so much time responding. But what, can you say more about that? Because I've actually been, you named a problem that I, that I knew I had, but I hadn't been thinking about it. I mean, I, I, you, you, that, was, that was very useful to hear, and it's, uh, now I'm worried, so. So, well, um, yeah. So I think it is essentially uh, a year and a day since the IDW article appeared in the New York Times, which had its own weird effect on the world. And I think what we did is, is that we created a, uh, an immune reaction where the people who had jobs as professional commentators through institutions um, realized that there was some sort of a problem uh, relative to their business model, and they started attacking us with very low quality attacks. Like, you know, when, you, when you're calling Ben Shapiro the alt-right, something has gone wrong. Uh, and it's pretty obvious. I don't know whether the kippah yeah, yes. doesn't have the effect on, on them that it does on me. Um, and I think we've been, we've been immersed in bad critique. Critique that doesn't make sense to us, overblown critique, critique that misses the mark, and so, you know, weirdly, perversely, when I hear somebody called alt-right by the people I know who've completely missed the mark and have called Brett Weinstein alt-right or something like right. that, um, I become intrigued. Oh, that person must be saying something reasonable, which is a terrible thing to, uh, to have in your mind that the critique is so bad that you can almost put a minus sign in front of it uh, to find out who, who might be interested to talk, interesting to talk to. I believe that when I recently, and I, I don't want to get into the details, heard a very high quality, compassionate, thoughtful critique uh, of one of the members of, of this uh, so-called intellectual dark web, I was shocked. It's like, oh, is the, are those the points that people have been sort of pawing at, trying to make? Because it was completely understandable. I, I got every point. I thought right. a lot of them landed. And I think that we are, are now finding ourselves uh, in a world in which it's very hard to even understand what's being said to us. And I'm just, I don't think it's you. I'm getting worse and worse and worse as the 
the lousy, terrible critiques that are motivated by the political economy of a failing business model rather than intellectual charity and fairness and, and a sense of equanimity and comity. Um, as those attacks pile up, uh, I find that um, I'm just, I'm, it's like playing against a bad tennis player and, and my tennis game has just gone to hell. Right. So I, I, yeah, yeah. have you had this experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I didn't, I, I, again, I knew I was, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know I was the problem. And uh, yeah, I, I do feel that the, the, feeling the need to respond to the toxicity has, has, um, uh, it's, ta it's taken a toll on the quality of one's thought because you're, th you're then, you're, you're then, you're, you can as safely assume in most cases that the argument coming your way is in bad faith. And then you, you, you wind up taking this posture, I think, for too long. And you lose, I mean, it, for me, it, it, it's, it's now seeming like a failure of empathy. Like I can no longer uh, understand the experience or view of the person who is objecting to the position I've taken because I have, I have encountered so many bad faith versions of the objection. Um, and it takes a, um, I, you know, I, I, I think it takes a, a further effort to um, just see the situation uh, as though for the first time, right? I mean, we're, we're just we're getting jaded, I think, in in, de in these culture war issues. Yeah, and and, and 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 we're being degraded. So one of the things that I found really interesting was that um, part of this critique I was listening to mentioned Tommy Robinson, uh, who is this fierce immigration critic and maybe critic of Islam inside of the UK. And I don't know very much about him because I don't think much about the UK. But the, the, the point had to do with the fact that he was extremely skilled at being reasonable and charismatic and moderate under certain circumstances. Right. And if you're demonizing everybody who you don't like as you know, worse, worse than Stalin or, or, or Hitler or whoever, Mussolini, then none of the critiques land because in fact, the critique should be dependent upon the fact that the person knows what reasonable sounds like and is able to be reasonable. Now, I'm not saying whether Tommy Robinson is reasonable or not reasonable. I don't know enough about the situation. But I think it's very important to, to talk about um, people who actually have a very clear idea of what reasonable sounds like. I think Milo can be reasonable for periods of time before he becomes uh, you know, a complete ass. And, the well, what do, what do we all think about this dynamic? So you, you've just, what you've pointed to is the fact that people who we think are beyond the pale, I'm assuming many of us think Milo is, is uh, for some reason, for various reasons, beyond the pale, can sound totally reasonable if given a chance, and that there's something wrong with so-called platforming them well, even that, even and, and letting them do that, right? So that term, I hate platform. Like, who speaks like yeah. that? I don't even like the verb. Right. Two party, like I wouldn't want to conjugate, you know, like two fiesta in right. Spanish or something right. like that. Um, but so, but I know, like, so I've just experienced this from the other side. Uh, so I was just on on Kara Swisher's podcast, um, and I noticed she's getting immense pain for having platformed me, right? Like I'm her Milo Yiannopoulos, or you know, and so I see her. I see the see the the horror of her audience that she deigned to have a conversation with me. And um, it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarre, but in her world, that's what happened. I showed up, I sounded reasonable, I, I, given us, given us you know, a, a bit of runway, I was able to sound disconcertingly reasonable for her audience. And yet her audience knows I'm the gateway drug to something horrific. Uh, and so they're blaming her for having even had a conversation with me. So this is the bad version of the problem, in my, in my estimation, um, where that is insane to me. But, and, but presumably there's a case where it is sane because if you put a genuine white supremacist or some, some other nutcase on your podcast or on your show and fail to reveal what's wrong with them. You let them... No, but, but what if I put uh, a nutcase on the show and 
I do reveal what's wrong with him, but it's still, he's found inspiring uh, to somebody who wishes to commit acts of violence, right? right? So what are my responsibilities? We've never worked this out. We've never had a really good conversation about the fact that the Sam Harris platform and the Sam Harris human are very different than, than let's say, the Michelle Goldberg human on the New York Times platform. And a lot of these t traditional commentators have lower engagement as individuals. And if you think about the fusion between the chair and the human, the chair has a lot of the power. Like any time the New York Times says that person there is worth listening to, that person, whether they have interesting ideas or not, or good or bad ideas, becomes super important because they inherit power from the chair. So now when that sort of set of responsibilities comes through to me, like I don't have a book, I don't have a show, I got mm -hmm. nothing. I just, I, I, my, my wife tells me, you know, I'm tired of your theories, go to Twitter and, and, and try it out with, you, with your audience. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's my platform. And, I, and then I hear things like, Eric, you have a platform, you have a tremendous responsibility. It's like, what platform? I just, I signed up for Twitter. And that, that kind of weird new problem is super interesting because I've never really had to think about this. I built the entire thing completely 100% by myself, uh, you know, while I'm like doing the dishes and I'll, I'll type something and then suddenly, you know, I've got a thousand people who are angry at me or, or really interested in something I have to say. We haven't had the discussion about the ethics of what if you succeed at what it is that you're doing on social media. We, and we're inheriting these questions from people who inherited their platforms. And we didn't inherit our platforms, we built our platforms. So we've never actually had a really good ethics discussion um, also about dining a la carte. There are very few people who are so horrible that they've never said anything remotely interesting or reasonable. I mean, I challenge you, Jeffrey Dahmer or you know, uh, Ted Bundy probably said reasonable things. You know, pass, pass the sugar, please. You know, not every instance uh, uh, of an utterance from a bad person, a horrible person, is horrible or without content. Um, you know, in physics, Paul Ehrenfest uh, murdered his own son and then took his own life. Uh, you know, he's a pretty reasonable, interesting guy and a great friend to many. So we, I, the thing I really hit you with, mm -hmm. which, is, which I think is really disturbing, is let's imagine that we're, in the, we're at the end of a 45 to 50 year bubble dominated by the baby boomers. And what if the principal lesson is that in the world that they lived in and, and that they inherited from the silent and greatest generations, that the amount of nuance and neural horsepower necessary was, that was communicated to us for dealing with the world was about two, to, two orders of magnitude too low. Like, think about if any of you remember bad shows from the 70s and 80s, like The Love Boat versus The Complexity of Game of Thrones. It's not comparable. Television got awesome. You can't look at these super complicated dramas and, dramas and say, well, that's the idiot box, because it's not the idiot box. Okay, well, my world right now is about two orders of magnitude more complex than what the New York Times wants to tell me it is based on the idea of you, sir, are a restrictionist, you must hate foreigners. There's no syllogism in the world that sounds like that. And these old ideas about how little it takes to, to, to get through life are going to crash. And you and I are trying to talk about super nuanced things, about dining a la carte. I don't think everything Milo Yiannopoulos says is stupid. I think he may be beyond the pale, but he's not constantly beyond the pale. Right. And I think he said a lot of provocative, interesting things. How do I dine a la carte at all of these different menus, you know? Right, so but you're threatening to launch a podcast, which I encourage. Will, will you have no, Milo you, on it? Well, so you said that you encouraged it, but I was yeah. going to call it sense-making, and then... <laughs> <laughs> I beat you to it. Very clever, <laughs> sir, yeah. Um, so you, I, Milo might take your call. Would you, would you have him on it? Yes, but I think I have a new awareness of what it is that people are saying when they, when they clutch their pearls and say, oh, horrors, you platformed Milo Yiannopoulos. I think that the, what they're really saying is um, make sure that when you present Milo Yiannopoulos, because he is a skilled communicator in many ways, that you don't artificially present him in a simple and positive light if, in fact, you believe him to be a dangerous actor. Right. And I think right. that um, 
this idea of having to take on the responsibilities of previous generations of, uh, of, of, of commentators, of newscasters, uh, I, I sort of resent the idea that I have the same responsibilities as the Washington Post, and that people keep calling this thing my platform when it's just my account. Um, but I'm gonna have to figure that out because I've got over 200,000 people who are actually taking me seriously, which freaks me out every time I look at my phone. I'm like, oh my God, you guys are still there. I mean, it, it, it's a very strange idea that this is bigger than Michelle Goldberg's account. Right, right. Well. So are there questions in that area, just how to deal with culture war issues and, and people who have ideas or who have done things that are, put them beyond the, the, the Overton window or outside of it? I feel like I'm hogging this thing. Huh? Um, yeah, it, it's right in line with your last podcast with Shane. Mm -hmm. He said you have like a million followers on Twitter. And do you feel like a moral responsibility to fact check and make sure that everything you're putting out there is... 100% accurate and right in line with the bar that you've raised on a moral and ethical level? Uh, more so. I mean, now I feel a moral responsibility to pay less attention to Twitter, I mean, given, given the, the way it deranges so many things. I, I think it's, it's giving me a, a false signal that that's the world. Like, this is a, a sampling of public opinion that I need to take seriously. And, and Twitter really is a, a very distorted sample. So, um, but yeah, no, I just, I just had this experience where I, f I forwarded an op-ed that seemed totally reasonable to me from the Wall Street Journal. And it was a, a guy talking about how, having been targeted as, a, as a, a, a hate monger by the Southern Poverty Law Center, how that had deranged his life, right? He has got death threats and, and, um, and on his account, I didn't know who this guy was, but on his account it was totally unwarranted because he, he had just agreed as a lawyer, he's a, a lawyer, he, he, had, he had agreed to represent the bakery that didn't want to bake the, the, the cake for the gay wedding, right? And it completely upended his life when the Southern Poverty Law Center you know, branded him a, a merchant of hate. And so that's the article. Now I've had my own run-ins with the Southern Poverty Law Center. It used to be this absolutely necessary and noble institution that would find all of the white supremacists and the, and the militia nuts in our midst. And um, someone, someone should be doing that, right? But now they, they've kind of run out of Nazis and they're finding people who are my friends, who I know to be you know, ex-Muslims, who are, who are um, totally rational and ethical people or, or even you know, current reform, Muslim reformers like Majid Nawaz, uh, and then they found me, right? So, so I know that there's something wrong over there at the Southern Poverty Law Center. So this was an article attesting to a more extreme version of an experience that I know firsthand, and I pushed it along on Twitter. And ironically, had I taken my own advice of just not paying attention to what's coming back at me on Twitter, I wouldn't have noticed the aftermath. But the aftermath was something that I, I should have noticed because... It turns out this guy represents an organization that isn't just happy to defend people who don't want to bake cakes for gay people. They're not just against gay marriage. They think homosexuality itself should be criminalized. Right? They, they, they want to see people in prison for, for being gay right? or, or, or uh, practicing any uh, gay sex acts. So, um, so then I seem to be someone who was you know on that Thursday or whenever it was was just taking a stand in you know solidarity with this you know genuine homophobe and bigot uh, and you know, in, in, in his case religious nutcase uh, and I was just reaping the whirlwind of pain from my own audience like okay so this is this is who you're allied with now yeah, I mean, you've completely sold out to you you've been so deranged by your collisions with the left that now you're aligning yourself with, with true bigots. And the truth is, I had no idea who the guy was, and I had been relying on the Wall Street Journal to curate their opinion page. I w it would never occur to me that they would publish uh, a, 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 the opinion piece, a self-serving opinion piece that gave no hint. I mean, it's exactly the problem you just described. He, he, within the frame of his opinion piece, could seem totally reasonable, and the, and the Wall Street Journal hadn't curated it in a way to, to, to reveal that the, the sheer fact that they published him 
seem to be uh, an endorsement of his reasonableness on some level. And the fact that I can't, I mean, but it's an untenable position. The idea that you can't forward anything you found interesting unless you fact check the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or the Economist or the New Yorker, um, you know, it seems it's just there's just not enough time in the world to do that. So, yeah, but I do think one has to be somewhat careful because. But I think there's also just an intellectual problem. So, for example, uh, I recently decided that I needed to join a uh, hate group that advocated violence on Facebook. And um, you, you decided to join that group? I had to. Uh -huh. I realized that uh, I didn't believe in this idea that hate and violence are simply bad things. I went back to Ecclesiastes, which was the, uh, no, I'm not kidding. I mean, it, to every season, <laughs> And there's a time and a purpose under heaven. And right now, if you think about the bird song, you know, a time to kill? Really? A time to hate? These people have to be uh, off of these platforms. This is bananas. So I found my hate group, um, which is the Peshmerga Women Fighters Group support. I encourage you all to join. Yeah. Um, we hate ISIS. That's our thing. Uh, and we encourage violence against ISIS to protect our Peshmerga women from okay. rape and uh, and abuse, and um, I'm all for this. You, you join you join the group. Yep. You're not looking very Peshmerga or very. Oh no, we we take this. I'm I, I'm quite serious about okay. this. Uh, the idea that violence is simply bad and that hate is always wrong. Uh, you know, Tim Tim Cook did the speech at Apple, where he said there is no place for bigotry or, or hate or negativity on our platform, and we, we're getting rid of it because it's the right thing to do. So I went to the Apple Music Store, and you know I found uh, Some Girls, uh, which ca contains the odd line, uh, black girls just want to get stupped all night, uh, <laughs> to use the Yiddish right. for, the, for the French, for the English. <laughs> and like that's right there. Well, what are you doing? Get, get rid of that, man. You can't have the Rolling Stones on that platform. Uh, to say nothing of all of these other, I mean, let's, what's Lolita, that's got to go, Song of Songs, you know, that seems inappropriate for the children. So where does this end? We don't have any good ways of talking as adults about what this new digital situation is, and nobody's got the answer. I was just talking to Jack Dorsey uh, about this, and I said, I don't think you have a solvable problem. Yeah. You have an insoluble problem. It is intellectually and technically insoluble. And so... Just to make this point, we keep hearing about classical liberalism, and I realize, no, 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 we have a problem. Uh, we need quantum liberalism. And what do I mean? Well, we're entangled. We have our, our friend Rafe Badawi's wife uh, getting Twitter's passing along the idea that she is violating pa Pakistan's blasphemy laws, which is freedom from speech. But she's in Canada, where they have freedom of speech. So we've now entangled freedom from speech with freedom of speech, and a person who has no relationship to Pakistan is getting lawyer letters uh, because Twitter is acting as a pass-through. Uh, that's one problem. The other problem is the relativistic problem, right? You, you, now I, I have a brain fart, and I can send it to a quarter million people almost um, instantaneously. And suddenly I've got some guy in Chile telling me I have no idea what I'm talking about, and that I'm, I'm actually destabilizing his local community. Well, OK, the Second Amendment <laughs> Uh, was not written in this era. We keep talking. Uh, gun control people often say, "You realize that the first, uh, that the, that the, sorry, the Second Amendment was written at a time when it took a minute to reload a musket, and they were highly inaccurate." Well, the First Amendment was written in the time when you when you had to do things through pamphlet, right? And there's a lot of friction in that system. So now we're in this like relativistic regime. We're in a quantum entangled regime, and we have a classical document governing all of this stuff. And I'm, I'm going to say something quite bold that I actually haven't said yet, which is, what if the Constitution really isn't up to the task as a classical document of dealing with a new regime? Like, what if this is such a deep paradigm shift that it's not some cute little app, uh, but it effectively entangled an entire planet to create legal problems that are now insoluble and none of us are thinking like founding fathers. We're not thinking like people with right privileges on the Constitution. When is the last time we amended the document? Maybe we're getting this completely wrong. Right, except the flip side of that is when you think of the people who could amend it, then the spirit of conservatism comes over you all of a sudden, doesn't it? 
hence our problem. And I think, I, to, just to be horrible about it, um, right now, what I think we, we see is several different groups uh, waiting for this baby boomer edifice of stories and narratives that came from the greatest and the silence. And, you know, some of it had percolated to us as a Gen X group. Um, this thing is dying, and it's going to die hard. And the technology is different, and we need to get people in place. I, I think one of the things that we need to do a better job of is figuring out what was it that the left was in this new incarnation before it went batshit crazy, hmm. right? Because yeah. there are points, and they ruin every one of their best points by taking it into some bananas realm, and then no one will speak up because who wants to be doxxed? Nobody wants to be doxxed. So all the smart people are saying, well, I do have a point, but I'm not going to share it because I know that everybody would be really angry. And what is it, this, this weird thing that we're doing? I think what it is, is it's a, we have to reboot sense making. Period, the end. We have to reboot sense making aware that the technological shift of the internet is far more profound. You know, we, we talk about the Gutenberg uh, press, and what if this is like much more important than the Gutenberg press, but it's got some goofy little bird or thumbs up, and that's, that's really obscuring how profound this is, because you know, Google's in all primary zany colors. No, it's nothing like that. It's absolutely nothing like this. We have a quantum entangled relativistic world, and we have to figure out what quantum liberalism is and relativistic liberalism, and going back to classical liberalism and saying free speech uh, is a good instinct, but the situation has progressed. And if it, if it ultimately leads to misery and enervation and all of these other things, nobody's gonna want free speech, right? Nobody's going to want the, the, the commitment to the, we have to figure out, I don't want to abandon the enlightenment, we have to upgrade the enlightenment. We need to continue where the Scotsman left off. And we need to make sure that it is pluralistic. We need to make sure that the structural oppression claims are steel manned to the best possible degree. We cannot trust the leftists with their own points because they suck at it. They're so aggressive, they're so simplistic, they're so stupid, they're so just, uh, the weird thing is they're so non-compassionate. They don't care who they hurt. Some, often. some of them might be in the room with us. <laughs> raise your hands and let's talk. All right, raise your hands. We've got a t time for a few more questions. Right. Oh, is that Mason Hartman? Yes. yes. Mason Hartman, you should, you should be following her on Twitter. It's worth getting on Twitter to follow Mason. Mason Seconded. is one of the smartest people on Twitter. Hey, Mason. Yeah, it's uh, at WebDevMason, mm -hmm. so yeah, you should follow me on Twitter. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask is, I've been thinking a lot about what, in broad strokes, the problem is with the discourse now, and I think part of it is that it's impossible to talk about trade-offs, because when you do that, you automatically put a bounty on your own head for anyone to come along and play the re really easily played trump card that says, no, this person just wants us not to have nice things. We can have all the nice things if we defeat all the people who are talking about trade-offs. And um, the problem is that all of the, well not all, but a significant portion of the rent-seeking and the regulatory capture and the anti-humanistic efficiencies hide in the trade-offs. And if we can't talk about them... Do you have, have trade-offs in mind? Yeah, um, I mean, just about, about, it, about the platforming, deep pl pl platforming, right? About free speech, right? There are trade-offs. You can, you can move that dial one way or the mm -hmm. other, but there are going to be costs, whichever direction you move. And if we can't talk about that because, you know, only horrible people don't believe in free speech or only horrible people think that a monster like Milo should speak, then you can't, you can't talk about what, what we actually want, what we can have. Um, I don't know how to move past this. I don't know how do we get back to having those conversations. I don't know how we take that Trump card off the table. So I'm curious if you have mm. thoughts. Yeah, I don't know what a, a new regime would look like because any instance where it looks like someone has gone too far, 
you're going to invoke the wrath of everyone who thinks that. I mean, again, it's, it's arbitrary. It's like where you draw the line between Milo. I mean, I, I, now, I'm, now I'm worried that I don't understand Milo's case well enough and I've just sort of scapegoated him by using it as an example, right? He's not, he's not clearly bad enough to maybe warrant being the, being the noun we've been using here. But um, I don't know. I mean, I, the truth, honestly, I'm a little gun shy from my experiences of having had a few people on my podcast. I mean, the, the Charles Murray uh, podcast is perhaps the most salient, but it, it's, it's like, I, I, in that case, I was very conscious of being motivated by an altruistic impulse. Like, I, the, here, here's somebody who I think was unfairly demonized, and 25 years after writing a book, he still can't show up at a university without a threat of violence or a actual violence, right? And the whole free speech issue seems so colossally dysfunctional that I, that I thought, all right, I need to talk to him regardless of the, the, the apparent risk. The, I mean, and there's, there's no one I would ask who, who would advise me to do that, right? Um, but I, I do view Charles as a canary in the coal mine for this whole problem. You know that that you know the canary. Um, maybe, maybe there was somebody earlier, but I mean, t 25 years is a long time when you're talking about this problem. And but the result has been. I can't say that I regret it. I mean, because I, I, my view of Charles hasn't changed, and my view of of the, of the situation hasn't changed. But I definitely feel uncertain whether I will do that thing next time, right? Because it has just been, it has consumed so much of my life, the aftermath, right? And the mob is always in a position to make you pay that penalty, right? Uh, and so I, I don't know what the new regime will look like where it will be uh, much easier to clearly do the right thing not have to do all the, the moral arithmetic in advance before you simply just sit down and have a conversation with somebody. Um, and uh, I mean, maybe you have some ideas, but I, I think it's, it's, I mean, there's some things that could change about social media that would make life better. I think, you know, anonymity could go away on, on platforms like Twitter and where people really need to own their comments. But the truth is the worst stuff that happens to me comes from people with blue check marks who have no apparent conscience around lying and, and distorting things. So, um, do you have an intuition here? Sure. Um, I think we're going to just all have to start getting closer to being in touch with things like data and theory in the way professors and medical doctors and lawyers and various experts are. So, for example, uh, it is a truism uh, on Twitter, uh, particularly left of center Twitter, that bad people believe that you can tell something about intelligence from measuring the shape and size of a head. It is also a truism on Wikipedia that micro, microcephaly, having a small head from birth, uh, which is you know, associated with the Zika virus, has some aspect of interaction uh, with cognitive functioning. Now, we both, I have both of these ideas in my head, and I know what the issue is. The issue is don't help manufacture precursor for racist or bigoted or nasty arguments about the superiority of one group over another, however that plays out. Okay, I understand, don't manufacture precursor, but that's like saying saltpeter is bad. Well, saltpeter is saltpeter. There's nothing you can do about saltpeter, potassium nitrate when combined with sulfur and charcoal has some pretty interesting effects. Do you want to keep that information secret? Do you have an idea, thou shalt not go adjacent to a bad point, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, when, when Jordan Peterson says, the reasonable women have to rein in their harpy sisters because the optics of men doing it uh, just isn't right, harpy sisters sounds pretty bad. I, I think I know what he means, but he is adjacent to something extremely dangerous. And so when you're talking about all these things, a lot of people who have the idea that we're going to keep order in society by covering things up like the fact that vaccines have some risk. Well, this is kind of getting really scary. If we say vaccines carry absolutely no risk, 
somebody's going to say, I know that's not true. That's not possibly true, right? Well, maybe that was workable as a public health solution in a previous era. Tough. It's not workable now. If you want to say something like vaccines may carry some tiny risk, but don't be a moron, uh, vaccinate your children, because let's think about the, other, the, the various risks, and we have a coordinated action people, uh, problem, people, and you need a better public service announcement that actually represents your level of cognitive you know, sophistication. We've broken regimes. I don't think we're going to be able to say vaccines are 100% safe with zero risk anymore. And I don't want people to die of preventable diseases because we haven't figured out that we need new moves. Well, there I think you're, what you're appealing to is the need for people to be better connoisseurs of information. I mean, just so the, just the notion of risk, right? Like the fact that we know that being truly honest about vaccines, right, within the span of any public service announcement uh, could dissuade some people who don't understand the concept of risk or the concept of probability from being vaccinated at all or vaccinating their kids. We know that that's, I mean, you, you have this concept, this, this phrase you've used elsewhere, load-bearing fiction. Right. right? There's some, some moments depend on using the right fiction in place of truth because so much depends on people just doing the right thing. And some people aren't going to be able to do the right thing if you give them too much information. But generally speaking, well, we just have to, we have to, this is the burden of, of education. We have to teach people to hear the facts as intended in those kinds of conversations. And so, I mean, the example that comes to mind here is that I mean, if, if someone's going to worry about the, the, the risk such as it is incurred by, by a vaccine, they have to be able to hold that next to all the other risks they happily incur and, and, and run for their children that are much greater risks of injury and death than being vaccinated. So I mean, do you go skiing? Do you let your kids ride a bike? Do you have a swimming pool? These are all horrific risks if you're going to, be, if you're going to care about the risk of, of being vaccinated for MMR. Right? right, but there will be truths that will not behave or play the way we wish them to. Right. And there's nothing we can do about it, and it's going to be harder and harder to hide those truths using the same tools that we previously hid those truths. I, you know, you and I have no love for ethnicity and IQ studies. I'd rather not know. I don't care, and I don't think that much hinges on IQ. Um, you know, Richard Feynman had 125 IQ, according to legend. He seemed to do okay in theoretical physics. Yeah, I, I think it, it doesn't. Well, so, so, but this is, I would argue, this is an example of you try, trying mightily to find a convenient truth where a, a more annoying truth is actually present. IQ, there, IQ does measure something important. It measures stupidity we, we much better than it. it measures intelligence. That's one of the things that IQ seems to do. Well, so, well that, uh, Jordan, sort of, Jordan, sort I of. asked Jordan about this, for example, and his, his line was, uh, yes, Eric, technically you're right. There are many ways to be intelligent, but there does seem to be only one way to be stupid right. and something like that. And yes, there are truths, but I am going to try to, in some sense, cover up some of these things with load-bearing fictions that aren't too far off, and I'd like some help you know, I mean, but, but see, this is why I, I wanted to talk to Charles in the first place because I just think we're going to stumble on this every which way we can't ha for having for reasons that have nothing to do with IQ. It's just basically anything we care about in ourselves or in others, right? Mm -hmm. So intelligence is one of a hundred. Take, take, take the top hundred, all right? Conscientiousness, compassion, uh, lack of a propensity for violence. Um, being violent in the right circumstances as opposed to the wrong, wrong circumstances, uh, being able to read people's emotions, any, it just anything. Anything we're going to train our AI to do, if we build AI we can like live your, with. The ratio of your second and fourth digits to tell you how much testosterone you were exposed to in your utero. Like, that's a really, you know, suddenly I just don't right, want well, to Well, that's just a weird... Weird fact, but right, right, but well, it, but it's a tell. I yeah, didn't, I, did, yeah. I didn't know I was giving away that kind of information, right? Right, right. and uh, you know, or suddenly maybe you have like some weird little rapid eye movement that can be correlated with some sort of 
uh, personality disorder, who knows what. It's going to get very hard to hide these sorts of things. But, um, but I'm not even talking about whether we look for them or not or whether they're tells or not. I'm just saying that whatever we can care about in a person or in a group of people, there are no two groups of people who are biologically and culturally distinct who will have, as groups, the same mean value for every one of those hundred things we care about. That would be an absolute miracle. Well, the, so it, we know that if we tested for it, if we know if we com compare Italians to Norwegians, right. right, we know they will differ, then the mean value for everything we care about will be different. That's right? true. And so clearly a sane and ethical politics cannot be predicated on our denying that until the end of the world or, or never stumbling upon the evidence of those differences when, as, we look for, as we look to understand the, the biological basis of intelligence or disease or a sense of humor or anything, right? And so my knowledge that we are guaranteed to be ambushed by these seemingly invidious differences yes. between groups made me want to say, okay, listen, we all have to grow up and just talk about this honestly, right? It can't be, our politics can't be a matter of pretending these mean differences don't exist and will never be found, right? And yet, I mean, you might be right. You might be right that for, it's wise for most people most of the time to pretend otherwise that, that, that because it's just too, it's too painful to have these conversations. Well, and I mean, there are, there are bright spots. I mean, for example, this idea of Fisher's level of uh, concept of equivalence between males and females within a geographic you know, population mm -hmm. says that you should expect that it is as good to be male as female as a reproductive strategy. The, the distributions will be different, but the expected return from each of the, each of the strategies is the same, so that's good news. Um, there are truths that I wish to hide from. There are other truths that we may actually think are uncompassionate to talk about, but are actually hyper-compassionate once we actually plow through them. I don't right. think that the differences between people are so vast that over time, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's as frightening as people imagine. Uh, well, yeah, that I mean, that we're but, lucky that that is true. Yes, right? but yeah. but we're in a really tough spot where some of us want to go back to a single narrative that sort of organized society. Uh, all men are created equal. You know, it's in some sense aspirational, it's in some sense a falsehood, in some sense it's true. Um, we are going to have to be extra compassionate and decent about these things and recognize that we're going to be dealing with a lot of frightening stuff that is known to doctors, known to educators, known to specialists, and that the exoteric, esoteric division, uh, lots of things that were previously esoteric are going to be pushed out into the public and we're gonna to have to deal with them. And I, I just think that there's like one big message, which is classical is over. The technology is too powerful now. We're gonna start picking things up. The, the one that really made it clear to me that I can't fight the like ethnicity and IQ or gender and IQ thing is, uh, I looked at the world chess standings. I went and ch said, here's a proxy for something. Maybe interest, maybe structural oppression, maybe IQ, maybe some kind of spatial intelligence, not sure what. But it was 99 to 1 males to females uh, in the top 100. In the top yeah. 100. Yeah. And there's no way to hide from it. I can't hide from it. It really bothered me. And I said, like, okay, please, please, please. African descent, what do we got? Three grandmasters. Like, shit, not good. I don't know what that is. What do we do? I, I'm not sure. I can't hide from these things because they're stark and they're known and they're on like the microcephaly point. You know, if you happen to get Zika virus, you th th there's a pretty serious issue at hand. Are we going to hide from all of these issues? We can't. It's, there's just no, we, we've run out of the ability to do this particular move. We're going to have to become more decent, more loving, more compassionate, not, we can't do this Stefan Molyneux thing where he's like, oh, my ancestors did this, my, shut up, it's enough, it's terrible, don't do that. We well, are going well, to have me, to- it just seems like the answer is clear in that the differences between groups 
whatever they are for whatever variable you care about. Right. And whatever amount is bio biological and whatever amount is environmental, both are true for certainly everything we care about. It, do it doesn't matter when considering any individual. The fact that you're a man yeah. of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, right? Shh. Okay, well yes, I just outed you. Yeah. Um, um, you now have three parentheses. For my, uh, <laughs> um, that tells me almost nothing about you. I mean, you, you still have to be taken on your own merits, yeah, right? You, but you know so, that I'm not going to win the Boston Marathon because before 1987, it was never won by anybody, I think, from Kenya or Ethiopia. And after 1987, it seems to be almost always won from right. not only people from those two countries, but some tiny region in those two countries, because people in those two <laughs> regions have some biological advantage. That we, you know, we sit around, we say, well, they've got more heart, and they care more, and they run to school. And, you know. right. but, if you, but if you are the outlier Ashkenazi, you can right. still win the Boston, Boston Marathon, right? So it, it's not, it, it, you still have to be treated as an individual. Well, well I, didn't, I didn't actually mean I you. I love this country. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But one, one answering to your, your group identity might win the Boston Marathon. Uh, so it's still, it's always a matter of caring about individuals, right? I mean, that, that's the politics and the ethics of it. It's never a matter of saying, well, See, but even there, we're, we're we, just not, we don't want the Jews we, anywhere we near got, the marathon because there's just going to be obstacles. We got this wrong. Huh? Yeah. Well, I'll well, find some yeah. way of okay. putting the... Uh, okay. the um, uh, no, I, I think and I, I think now th notice Tom, we're going to have to bring it into the end zone right okay. here. Um, I, I think that we made this point that it's not collectivists, it's the individual. It was way too simplistic for us, for our group. It's not true. It, it's like multi level selection. It's going to happen at the level of the individual, it's going to happen at the level of the family, it's going to happen at the level of the ethnic group, municipality. All of these different overlapping. Uh, groups of individuals are going to have aspirations, sense-making, communal coordinated action, et cetera, et cetera. We're, 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 I, the thing I'm now convinced of is that, yes, the individual is the most important thing. It's more important to care about the individual than the collective, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's, that's not quite what I'm saying. Because it's rational to care about the collective and right. for individuals to be convinced to make sacrifices for the, for the good of the group. But the group in this case has to be everyone in a society. It can't be just white people, just men, just lesbians. I mean, it ha you, it, this is why identity politics strikes me as a as a, a non-starter. Right. In, but nobody's going to give me uh, an F-16 to pilot if the hairs in my ears, you know, don't have particular characteristics. And the fact is, I'm colorblind, and I consider all of you contrast blind. So you're not as good at spotting ca camouflage. The, the image of you in an F F-16 is. Is arrested <laughs> for all the all the good and bad you, reasons. You know, I'd buzz your yeah. house for yeah. sure, right? But but you shouldn't have that much power. But there is there is some there is some issue which we're going to have to accept that you can't grow up to be anything you want to be necessarily, or if you do, you're going to have to do something more brilliant than everybody else. But does but is that a shock to anyone? Like everyone knows that, everyone feels that already. Yes, right? everyone's not. hit some wall that they couldn't get. You know, past. I was just talking to David Blaine, and David Blaine was saying that he he had club feet. And he wanted to win swimming meets. So how was he going to do it? He's going to learn how to hold his breath underwater for longer than anybody else so he didn't have to pay that particular tax. And guess what? Superpower acquired, right? OK. Sometimes you take people who you know, are in that Muggsy Bogues position you know, or Spud Webb or something like that, and you just tell me you're never going to be a basketball player. And you just get this middle finger, this beautiful, gorgeous middle finger come up at you. And somebody pulls it out of nowhere. And I, like those are the stories that just make me want to you know, stand up and cheer. I'm not necessarily, I don't know whether you can become anything you want to be. I don't know what this thing is in chess. I don't know if it's structural oppression. I don't know whether it's cognitive ability or interest. I do know that I can't hide from these things. And I, I think that I'm done with these simple answers. If we're really going to be some sort of a sense-making collective and we're going to do something, we're going to live up to the promise of our first year. I think we had a hell of a first year, to be honest, uh, with all the odds against us. And I'm sorry for the name. I know lots of you hate it. But it did spread and it did stick and it did do some stuff. The thing that we need to be able to do is to grow and to keep moving and to keep pushing the conversation forward and to give people the hope 
that there is some group of people trying to struggle with this stuff without going uh, you know, off the A-frame roof, either into being complete you know, dupe army uh, fools who just parrot the, the MSM as NPCs, or they become you know, noxious uh, alt-right troglodytes. This is, we gotta make the roof much easier for more people to dance in the middle. And we have to colonize the middle because the center, I mean, we have just this incredible endowment in this country, and we're gonna screw it up over nothing just because we can't handle some new technology and we need to get growth back in the system. And frankly, what I wanna do is I wanna provide hope over the next coming year that we're evolving and we're trying to think about these things and we're trying to bring everybody to the point of view that like, just try to remember what you used to do to watch things like The Love Boat or Gilligan's Island and then try to think about how much more happier you are with Game of Thrones and The Sopranos and that's the upgrade and we're gonna to have to do it with sense making across the board and let's not be jerks about it. That's, I think, what we're up to. I want all those hours back that I spent watch, watching Gilligan's Island. <laughs> that, that surely imposed some psychic cost. Marianne? Yeah. <laughs> well, OK. Uh, well, listen, thank you all for coming. This was an experiment. You were all part of it. And uh, it was really an honor to, to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. And, you should have a podcast.